We're going to deal primarily with prokaryotes in this course in microbiology. In particular, we'll talk about bacteria, but archaea are another example of the prokaryotes. However, I wanted to make the comparison to eukaryotes here so that you have context for your understanding of the prokaryotes. On the right here, we have an image of a eukaryotic cell. This would just be a typical eukaryotic cell. On the left-hand side, we have a bacillus bacterium with flagella at one end of the cell. In red here, uh, ribosomes, DNA, plasma membrane, and cytoplasm are all structures that are found both in prokaryotes and eukaryotes. We'll talk about a couple of other structures of prokaryotes in the next slide. However, I did want to point out that this image is to scale. A prokaryote is on the order of about a micrometer in lit width and then two to three micrometers in length if you're talking about a typical bacillus. On the other hand, eukaryotic cells, red blood cells for example, are about 10 micrometers in diameter. Uh, cells like white blood cells are going to be up to 20 micrometers in diameter. So bacterial cell in terms of its width and length is quite small relative to the size of a eukaryotic cell. So I've zoomed in on this image here of the prokaryote because this is the basis for the remainder of today's lecture. And we're going to focus on just some parts or some structures that are found within the microorganism. On the outside here, you'll find fimbriae, and we'll also talk about pilus later on. Here, you find the flagellum that are required for movement. We also have the slimy looking layer here is known as a glycocalyx, and I'll talk about the importance of that later on. We have layers of cell membrane and peptidoglycan that is collectively known as the cell envelope and we'll talk about the importance of this envelope in a later lecture. And on the inside of the cell then we have ribosomes, we have proteins, uh, genes that are, are proteins that are carrying out the necessary functions of this microorganism. We've also got plasmids which are short fragments of DNA. And these plasmids can carry on them genes that are not necessary for life, but I like to think of them as genes that enhance the lifestyle of the microorganism. For example, they may encode antibiotic resistance genes, or they may encode genes that allow for the organism to become pathogenic or to allow it to cause disease. We also have here the chromosome and there is usually one chromosome it's usually circular and the region where it's located is known as the nucleoid. The nucleoid is not membrane bound it is simply a location where replication and transcription occurs and this is something that makes it distinct from the nucleus. The nucleus is an organelle membrane bound organelle that houses the DNA uh, and where transcription occurs in eukaryotic cells. But this nucleoid is not membrane bound. Now in terms of the comparison between prokaryotes and eukaryotes, we're going to compare and contrast five different features here. In terms of cellularity, prokaryotes are unicellular where you, pro, eukaryotes, I'm sorry, can be either multi- or unicellular. Secondly, uh, in terms of chromosomes, prokaryotes typically have a single chromosome, and this chromosome is circular, uh, whereas eukaryotes can have uh, or oftentimes have more than one chromosome. And in many species, though not all, these chromosomes are linear. So multiple chromosomes. Uh, the other thing to point out here is that whereas eukaryotes are diploid, they have two copies of each gene, uh, prokaryotes are haploid. They have one copy of each gene. So whatever that f the form of that gene is, that is the that will determine the phenotype of the microorganism.
We've already described prokaryotes as being small on the range of about one to, uh, we'll put here five micrometers. Uh, eukaryotes, on the other hand, are going to typically be larger, and we use human cells as the range there. Prokaryotes do not have membrane-bound organelles, but they do have ribosomes, which is something that they share in common with eukaryotes. And eukaryotes do have membrane-bound organelles, which is one thing that differentiates these two classes from each other. Now, I just got done telling you that a typical bacterial cell or prokaryotic cell is on the range of 1 to 5 micrometers. And you can see on the far right over here, that's true for most of these, though there are some exceptions. Hemophilus influenzae is only about 0.25 in, in, uh, in width. Streptococcus pneumonia is less than a micrometer in diameter. And oscillatoria, which is a cyanobacterium, is much larger than... Uh, that range that I provided. The largest bacterium or prokaryote that has ever been identified is actually Epilopisium, which is found in the surgeon fish. This particular microorganism can grow to the length of 0.75 millimeters or 750 micrometers. And so you would be able to see this with the naked eye. Uh, I've provided here as comparison E. coli, which we've defined on the right-hand side as being a micrometer in width and three micrometers in length, and a paramecium, which is a single-celled eukaryote. Epilopisium is larger than this single-celled eukaryote. We've already described that the role of fimbriae is for attachment, um, as is the role of the pili, or the pilus, and pili is the plural form of that. So the difference between the two of them is that fimbriae, they are more fine hair-like structures. Pili are hollow protein tubes, and so they're coated with protein on the outside, and the middle of it is, is actually hollow. And what this allows for, we'll come back to this later on in the semester, but this allows for transfer of genetic information from one cell to another through a process known as conjugation. What I'm going to do in the next couple of minutes is go over some of the different structures here and uh, use some of the prefixes that we can use to describe how bacterial cells group together. In the most simplest forms, a coccus or coccus or cocci, which is multiple coccus, are spherical in shape. I've already described a little bit that bacterial cells that have a bacillus morphology are rod-shaped. I've used that term at least in the previous slides. What we're going to talk about here are three different types of morphology and also use some of the prefixes that are used to describe how bacterial cells can group together. In the most simplest terms, coccus or coccus shaped cells, uh, and cocci is the plural of this, are spherical. Under a microscope, they'll look like a circle. Rods are going to look like this, and those are your bacillus-shaped cells. Spirals, on the other hand, can take a couple of different forms, and what will differentiate from each other are spirochetes from spirillum and also vibrio. Um, and we'll come back to this one in a minute, but first I want to cover co a couple of the basic features of, again, the, this, the cocci and the bacillus-shaped cells, or the bacilli. Uh, we have different types of prefixes that we can use to describe how these cells are oriented with one another. For example, the term streptococcus not only refers to a genus of species, but it also refers to the morphology. Streptococci bacterium are chained, and so strepto means chained. On the other hand, we have bacterial species that group together like grapes. And this clustering is known as staphylo. And one common microorganism that is important in the health setting are the Staphylococci or Staphylococcus aureus.
A third morphology we can have are just the diplo morphology. So diplobacillus would be two bacilli attached to one another. And then the final morphology or the, uh, that we, I'd want to cover here are the tetrads and the sarcina. Tetrads are found in groups of four. We usually find this with cocci shaped bacterium, whereas sarcina are balls of eight. And so typically we'll draw it kind of like this, but they are almost cuboidal or like a cube in structure. And they are, again, balls of eight bacterium. And so we'll look at this in the laboratory. Now, in terms of spirals, we have a couple of different morphologies, again, that I want you to be familiar with. Um, the most basic form is the spirillum, which is shaped something like this. That compares to spirochetes. Oh, there we go, spirillum. Spirochetes, on the other hand, are thinner typically, and there's one distinct difference in their movement, which we'll cover in the next few slides. So those are spirochetes. And the third that is of medical importance are the vibrio. And the vibrio are kind of like bean-shaped. They're kind of like bent rods. And so some folks will group them under the, the bacilli. Others will group them with the spirals. And again, vibrio is how we name these microorganisms. What I'm going to do in the next couple of minutes is go over some of the different structures here and uh, use some of the prefixes that we can use to describe how bacterial cells group together. In the most simplest forms, a coccus or coccus or cocci, which is multiple coccus, are spherical in shape. I've already described a little bit that bacterial cells that have a bacillus morphology are rod-shaped. I've used that term at least in the previous slides. What we're going to talk about here are three different types of morphology and also use some of the prefixes that are used to describe how bacterial cells can group together. In the most simplest terms, coccus or coccus shaped cells, uh, and cocci is the plural of this, are spherical. Under a microscope, they'll look like a circle. Rods are going to look like this, and those are your bacillus-shaped cells. Spirals, on the other hand, can take a couple of different forms, and what will differentiate from each other are spirochetes from spirillum and also vibrio. Um, and we'll come back to this one in a minute, but first I want to cover co a couple of the basic features of, again, the, this, the cocci and the bacillus-shaped cells, or the bacilli. Uh, we have different types of prefixes that we can use to describe how these cells are oriented with one another. For example, the term streptococcus not only refers to a genus of species, but it also refers to the morphology. Streptococci bacterium are chained. And so strepto means chained. On the other hand, we have bacterial species that group together like grapes. And this clustering is known as staphylo. And one common microorganism that is important in the health setting are the staphylococci or staphylococcus aureus. A third morphology we can have are just the diplo morphology. So diplobacillus would be two bacilli attached to one another. And then the final morphology or the, uh, that we, I'd want to cover here are the tetrads and the sarcina. Tetrads are found in groups of four. We usually find this with cocci shaped bacterium, whereas sarcina are balls of eight. And so typically we'll draw it kind of like this, but they are almost cuboidal or like a cube in structure. And they are, again, 
samples of eight bacterium, and so we'll look at this in the laboratory. Now in terms of spirals, we have a couple of different morphologies, again, that I want you to be familiar with. Um, the most basic form is the spirillum, which is shaped something like this. That compares to spirochetes. Oh, there we go, spirillum. Spirochetes, on the other hand, are thinner typically, and there's one distinct difference in their movement, which we'll cover in the next few slides. So those are spirochetes. And the third that is of medical importance are the vibrio. And the vibrio are kind of like bean shaped. They're kind of like bent rods. And so some folks will group them under the, the bacilli, others will group them with the spirals. And again, vibrio is how we name these microorganisms. Some bacterium will have a structure known as gly a glycocalyx, and a glycocalyx really just stands for sugar coat. Uh, these can be found in two f uh, flavors, capsules, which are more tightly bound to the outer membrane of the cell or to the peptidoglycan or cell wall, or the slime layer, which can be more easily washed away. The purpose of the glycocalyx will become more apparent later on in the semester as we'll talk about its role in avoiding phagocytosis by white blood cells or uh, eating of a bacterial cell by a white blood cell. But in addition, the glycocalyx will hold on to water so it is involved in dehydration resistance and also is highly sticky, and so it allows for bacterial cells to attach to surfaces as well. And that's something that it has in common with Fimbriae. On the top here is just an electron micrograph, a false imaged one, where in pink you see the glycocalyx or that capsule, and then the inside there in kind of that burnt orange color you have a, or sorry, a prokaryotic bacterial cell. And the bottom image is uh, what we call a capsule stain, uh, in which the cells are stained with a, a purple dye called crystal violet, and then um, also stained negatively with nigrosin stain and those halos around the cells that you observe are that capsule. Bacterial cells move toward or away from substances through the process of chemotaxis. And what chemotaxis refers to is movement toward or away from a chemical. So a chemical attractant or a chemoattractant is something that attracts bacterial cells and bacterial cells will make movement toward that chemical. Chemorepellents are something that bacterial cells will move away from. In this particular example on the right hand side here, what we find are uh, two, two beakers which have capillary tubes, one with no chemical in it, and that's this top one here, and one with a chemoattractant in it, which is this bottom one here. In the case of chemoattractants, what we find is that bacterial cells will go through a series of runs and tumbles where they kind of just move around or reorient themselves and they move in a new direction. And the goal here is for the bacterial cell to move over time toward increasing concentrations of the chemoattractant until it's at the highest concentration of that chemoattractant. Uh, chemoattractant. This movement is driven by the flagella that are found on the bacterial cells. There are a few different types of flagellar morphology. Not all bacteria have a flagellum, and for those we, we say that they are atricus. Uh, the trichus here at the end of each of these terms refers to the presence or absence of a flagellum. And so atricus would mean that there is no flagellum. The other structures include peritricus, in which we have flagella all over the cell. Um, in this case here you see salmonella, which is a peritricus organism. It's got uh, flagella at the poles, but also has it on the sides as well. We have monotricus organisms, mono meaning one flagellum. We have lophotricus organisms, like this vibrio here. And this lophotrichus means that it has a tuft of flagellum, polar meaning it has that tuft at one end of the cell. And then we have amphitrichus organisms like the spirillum found here. 
and amphi means that there are flagellum at both ends. Now sometimes you might find a couple of these terms uh, being used to describe the flagellar structure. For example, you can have an organism that is both amphitricus and also lophotricus if it has tufts at each end. We also would call this one that has a polar flagellar structure. Now there's one other particular flagellar structure that's not represented on the last slide and that is what's known as an endoflagellum. An endoflagellum is found underneath the outer membrane of a bacterial cell and we only find these endoflagellum associated with spirochetes and this is one distinguishing feature between spirochetes and spirillum. Spirillum don't have these endoflagellum. Endoflagellum are attached to the, the poles of the cell and then will undergo a clockwise or a counterclockwise movement to help the microorganism move. And note here that there is an endoflagellum at each end or at each pole of this spirochete.